Welcome subscribers. Welcome new subscribers. Thank you for following and sharing our videos. Thank you for supporting us. If you're new, hit the subscribe uh, button right now. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today, I wanted to talk about this book. I mean, this was the most awesome book I've ever read on the ancestors. Ancestral Medicine by Daniel Four. Uh, I'll leave some links down here to his lectures. You like? I would like to say 90% of the things that he he talks about with the ancestors in this book, I agree with it. And then there's some things in here uh, that I don't understand, so I can't disagree or disagree. And then the other 5% is that I kind of uh, disagree with him when it comes to the shamanic journey and, and consciousness. So there's some things on that that I, I disagree with him on. But this book here, oh my God, I recommend this is, you have to have this book. If you want to know how to uh, work with the ancestors from the beginning to the end in the most safest way as possible, safest, effective way as possible, and you want, this is the most awesome book ever, you know awesome book ever uh what i really liked about him and i have discussed this uh i don't know if i've discussed this with you guys before but i discussed when i first started working with the ancestors and looking at their trauma what i really i mean because it spans out the program it spans all the way out into racism and everything else when you go to do the healing on yourself you see all these programs that you are being exposed to and so he talked about that too. And he is, he's a white brother. And he was talking about him uh, killing his ancestors who were, may have been in that frame of mind. They may have been racist. So like I said, it's going to be a healing on both sides. You know, going, going in this direction and healing your DNA and all that and working with the ancestors. It's all connected. You know what I'm saying? At some point you're going to have to Look at you. Look at the vibration of your family. Look at the frequency of your family. Uh, great book. I can't brag enough on it, but this is the best book. Again, I recommend this book. From beginning to end, it tells you how to work with ancestors. He has a lot of good meditations in here to do. And see, as a lot of this stuff, I was already doing it through journey work. Like, he confirmed a lot of stuff. It, this book touched my heart because some of this stuff in this book uh I was already doing and then connecting with the trauma in my family oh my gosh he covers this so well like he does an excellent job on it for those of you who had dysfunctional family maybe you adopted you know or maybe you just have a best friend or a friend of the family you want to honor I mean he covers everything in this book this is an awesome awesome book I can't I can't emphasize it enough. I give it five stars all the way across the board. I've never seen a, I haven't seen a book this thorough on ancestral veneration and honoring the ancestors. Really, and I'll leave some links, like I said, I'll leave some links down here so you can hear some of his lecture because he do have some YouTube videos on, uh, on YouTube, but I'll leave some of these because I watched maybe like two of them, and I'll leave a link to one of his videos here so you can just hear his lecture. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, he breaks it down so simple. You know what I'm saying? I guess that's why I admire the work too because he makes it so simple, easy to do when you're working with the ancestor, even the elevation. And that's what more I'm into now because of the that karmic loop, because that, you know, all that going on with my, the trauma, I'm having to do a lot of elevation, a lot of cleansing on myself and a lot of elevation to my ancestors. You know, get the book, Ancestral Medicine. It's a must-have. You know, I, you know, I, like, why didn't I get this book at first? But then my ancestors just like, because you had to trust us that you was doing the right thing. And now it's trying, it's, I'm telling you, it, this is taking my, my, relationship with the ancestors to a whole brand new level some of the things i was already doing in, in here 
but I needed to um, do more ritualistic elevation when working with my ancestors. So this is a really good book. I'm going to read uh, the introduction in this book. I don't know where. I, I think I got it from Amazon. I think I paid $25 for it, but it, it, it runs up to $40. This has almost 300 pages in it. Uh, it's got like 12 chapters. Let me see. I want to make sure. I think it's 12 chapters. Yeah. Every last chapter is good. He breaks down lineage. He breaks down lineage. Who are the ancestors? And, the, and he brought, he talks about, too, you can work with ancestors beyond yours because they are ancestors. It doesn't matter their ancestors. He teaches you how to friend other ancestors, so to speak. This is a really good book. Uh, chapter one, my personal journey with the ancestors. Who are the ancestors? Spontaneous ancestral contact. Then he goes into part two, uh, family research, initiating ancestral healing. That's the one I like. Oh, my gosh. Meeting with the ancestral guides. That's really good uh, because he teaches you how to go back in your, if you don't have, all of us have good ancestors. And and he teaches you how to go through time and, and pick those ancestors. And that was really crazy. Because I was going, I've been going down to the mounds for like three or four years. I've been connecting with those ancestors. And when I asked for a sign that I was really communicating with me, I had a woman to come from Florida and bought me a shamanic uh, obsidian black shamanic dagger. I have a video on that if you if y'all are interested in uh, looking at that. I show you the shamanic, and I still have it. I use it on my uh, journey work when I go journeying. I use it on my ancestor altar. I still use it. Yeah, I still use it. Uh, seven, lineage ancestors and collective dead, assisting the remembered dead, integration and work with the living, honoring other types of ancestors, affinity ancestors. That's, that was the main thing right there. Like, it really got, I could say, when you got to chapter 11, that's when it kind of like got, to me, that's the part, like, I don't really get. I'm going to have to read that again. Because a lot of this stuff he's, he talks about in chapter 11, it's just like, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's a different cosmology. So I've never seen a cosmology like that. So I just really did get that, uh, cause some of that cosmology he has going on in uh, 11, chapter 11. Uh, and uh, 12, joining the ancestors. Preparing for death and all that stuff. So I, I'm going to uh, read the introduction to you guys. And then I'm going to read some highlights in the book. Things that I have marked. But this is an excellent book. And this book review may be a little long because I like this book so much. Like... <sighs> I just, it ain't even words to describe it because it really touched my heart. Like, some of the things that he was talking about, the ancestors that already revealed a lot of those things, and to see somebody who's right, written about it, it was just blowing me away on some of the things that he was sharing in this book. So, I do, I recommend it. If you're beginning, you want to know everything from A to Z, get this book if you want to work with the ancestors. But let me start with the introduction. It says, when you think of ancestors, who or what comes to mind? Ancestors are biological, historical reality for each of us, irrespective of our religious, racial, <clears throat> racial, and cultural backgrounds. Your blood lineage ancestors include thousands of women and men who, who lie, who live, Lives weave a story back to the first human beings in Africa over 200,000 years ago. If you were adopted or orphaned and will never know your biological parents, the ancestors still speak through the DNA in each cell of your body. They are reflected in your physical features, your health, and many of your predispositions. 
Beyond bloodlines, you might also claim as an as an ancestor, anyone whose life has inspired you, either personally or culture, culturally. This list might include extended and adoptive family, beloved friends, well-known people who touch your lives before their passing. Most religious traditions look to their human founders as embodiment of core values, spiritual teachings that have been passed through the generations. And they go on to rename religions and spiritual systems. Even if in the ostensibly secular United States, Americans collectively celebrate the lives of inspiring human beings with holidays such as Martin Luther King. I told you, we, we are on the worldly do it. We are already on our ancestors. That's why I don't see why a lot of people are scared of honoring their ancestors because we already do it here. Martin Luther King's Day, President's Day, Easter, Memorial Day, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, we all celebrate some sort of of death or ancestors. We all do it. We already do it. That's the killer thing, and people don't even realize it, but, you know, there's so much controversy. I'm sorry. I digress. I'm sorry. Everyone knows there are certain physical and psychological realities to being dead. That said, most people on earth also believe in some of, some sort of afterlife or continuity of consciousness after physical death after the physical death. Belief itself is a tricky thing. We might adopt a certain perspective and then have experiences that reinforce those views. Other times new experiences challenge our ways of seeing the world. For me, it was a mixture of both. I was not raised with the awareness of my family or lineage or ancestors. However, through the personal experience, clinical training, and mental health, and two decades of immersion to diversion lineages of spiritual practice, I became to experience them as important source of relationships and support. With that said, I assume, assume in this book that some aspect where we are, we are continuous after our death and that the ancestors are therefore real and worthy of our consideration and respect. In the pages that follow, I share in a deep, in-depth framework to support those who want to improve their relationship with the ancestors. I'm offering this information both for those who are new to the ancestors' work for season and for season practitioners. And I'm telling you, this book, that's all I can tell you. He know what he was doing in this book. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he's talking about. I saw present, present material in ways that are relatively free from religious dogma, compatible with most spiritual paths, and accessible for those who prefer not to identify with a specific tradition. In places where this framework diverges from your personal beliefs and training, be curious about the differences and trust your instincts about how to negate the gaps. Perhaps you are a psychotherapist, a priest, a psychic, a shaman, a ritualist, a healer, family elder, educator, or someone in a position to support others in navigating relationships with their ancestors. In this book, you will find many perspectives, exercises you might incorporate into your practice, providing you are first grounded in the healthy relationships with your own ancestors. If you're interested in genealogy, or family history and would like a greater context for honoring ancestors, this book presents ways to convey respect and gratitude to strengthen your direct channel of communication with them. Maybe you are seeking to make sense of spontaneous unsolicited encounters with spirits of the dead. If so, you will find a context of navigating potentially confusing and frightening experiences. And if you if you simply want to better understand individuals and traditions that claim to directly relate to the ancestors, this book can serve as a window into the ancestor reverence and ritual. Really good book. As you begin reading, you might find yourself thinking, why seek why seek to relate to our ancestors at all? From personal experience, my work as a psychotherapist and ancestor-focused ceremonialist, I have found relating to the ancestors to be healing and beneficial on a, at least three levels, personal, familiar, and cultural. 
on a personal level, research confirms that related in conscious ways with our ancestors supports physical and psychological health in the following ways. Reflecting on your ancestors boosts intellectual performance and confidence. Awareness of family pre predisposition, including behavior, health, risk, many encourage life choices that benefit you and future generations. Forgiveness, a common component of family healing and ancestor repair work promotes greater physical and mental health. Oh my gosh, like he he on top of his game. Like the I keep telling y'all the more you get into here, you know what I'm saying? The more you get into here, the closer you're gonna get to spirit. But you got to figure this out. You know what I'm saying? You have to go figure this out. He even talk about mediumship in here. Ancestors work also encouraging introspection and greater clarity about life purpose, which in turn creates more personal satisfaction and sense of sense of meaning in life. In getting to know and love my family ancestors, I feel more confident, supported, and comfortable in my skin. Moreover, I maintain a sense of healthy pride about my roots and culture of origin because we are partly composed of family karma of consciousness. Assist, assisting blood ancestors who are still in the need also improves our personal well, wellness and soul level health. On a familial level, sustained ancestors' work can help heal intergenerational patterns of dysfunction by working with, with the spiritually vibrant ancestors. You can start to understand, contain, and transform patterns of pain and abuse and gradually reclaim the positive spirit of the family. Oh my God, like, I told you this book. I'm sorry, y'all. This book is just, I'm telling you, it touched me right here because it, it, mm, I'm done. I've seen situations time again where one person engages the ancestor. It creates a ripple among the living family members who may suddenly reconcile after years of disagreement or restore overlooked blessings. When you engage in your loving ancestors, you can catalyze healing breakthroughs in your family, including establishing appropriate boundaries with living relatives. Also, when you make your, yourself available for ancestral repair work, the recently deceased are in turn more able to help living family members navigate their journey to become ancestors after death. Finally, on a cultural and collective level, the ancestors are powerful allies in transforming historical trauma relating to race, gender, religion, war, other types of collective pain. Recent findings in epigenetics are showing that in, in a very real way, the pain of our ancestors are endure through generations. In a landmark 2013 study on the biological transmission of trauma, a team of researchers in Jerusalem showed that the children as well as the grandchildren further descendants of the Holocaust survivors are especially prone to depression, anxiety, and nightmares. This tendency is tied to a biological marker in the chromosome that is absent and not descended from the Holocaust survivor. This transgenerational transmission of trauma is a new field of study. In many ways, it overlaps the ancestral repair work presented in this book. When we, when we reconcile with the ancestors who experience different types of persecution, who were enacting violence, they were enacted, and you'll see it in the family. Because my family, they study reenact the trauma over and over again. I mean, it's just like verbatim. The same things with the girls and the boys in the family, the men and the women. It's something. Uh, I'm sorry, I got the, the girls. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, let's see. Oppression. We make repairs in our personal psyches and family histories that in turn mend cracks in the larger spirit of humanity. This supports us in moving beyond identifying with the victim-victimizer consciousness and embodying what is beautiful and helpful from the past. Transforming generations of family and cultural pain also frees us to draw upon the support of the loving ancestors for prosperity in our vocation and service in the world. This book is organized into three parts. Part one, foundation ancestors work will give you an overview of different types of ancestors and ancestral engagement, as well as ways that ritual and ceremony, 
ceremony can help you connect with your ancestors. In chapter one, I share from my personal journey of getting to know and love my family ancestors. Chapter two introduces different types of ancestors and challenges that relate to each. Three explores types of spontaneous ancestral contact, such as dream visits, waking visions, and synchronicities. Chapter four outlines a framework for ancestors' reverence and ritual that establish the, establishes the foundation for the exercises and ritual work in the later chapters. Part two, healing with lineage and family ancestors presents a process for establishing lines of communication with supportive ancestral guides. This and part three are how-to sections of the book. Here you will learn to partner with wise and loving ancestors to assist the soul of any deceased family members. So you also learn how to be do mediumship in this um, book as well. You'll learn how to talk with spirit. So that's, that's neat too. Members who have not yet joined the ancestors. It's this very process and my desire to share it that motivated me to write this book. Chapters 5 speak gene of genealogy and family research and refers ways to make first contact with your ancestors. Chapter 6 emphasizes connection with the ancestral guides and teachers. In chapter 7 and 8, I share ways to assist both the forgotten and historical dead and the more recent remember ancestors. Part 2 concludes with ways to ground the work and family healing and presents rituals for ongoing relationship with family ancestors. In part three, honoring other types of ancestors, I offer a broader picture of relating to the ancestors. And he does too. Like that was so neat because I never looked at it like that. So that just really shifted my paradigm when he looked at it from that perspective. Uh, chapter 10, considers the ancestor relationships to, to specific places. Places. It includes an exercise for honoring the dead at a cemetery and suggestions for getting to know the ancestors near your home. So ancestors are ancestors. Yes, I was tripping out on that. I was tripping out that that really shift my consciousness uh, on what ancestors. I already knew ancestors were the trees, the grass, all this around us are the ancestors. The ancestors are everywhere all the time. I knew that. But just to look at it from that perspective that he's just breaking it down, describing it, I just had never just looked at it like that. In chapter 11, you will learn ways to honor ancestors of affinity and spiritual lineage, including those capable of supporting your work in the world. This chapter also presents exercises for further integration of work with different types of ancestors and explores the topic of multiple souls, reincarnation, past lives. Chapter 12 focuses on the funeral rites, the dying process, and the first year after death. I mean, this is it. And he does cover everything. So if you're interested in working with ancestors, mediumship, in a very safe way, he does it. I mean, some of his, um, some of his meditations in here remind me of the meditations that I already have on my channel. And I'm just like, wow, you know what I'm saying? I was just tripping off that. I just could not believe it. I was just so blown away by that. You know, I'm just speechless behind it. This book grew out of my training with human teachers, my personal relationship with the ancestors, and my experience in guiding others in ancestors' work. Like other teachers, I share what works well for me. Please take what helps you and leave the rest. There are some inherent risks in working with ancestors, and I suggest reading through the entire book before deciding whether or not to engage, engage them directly. If you do decide to engage your ancestors, keep, in, keep it positive and reach out for support if you get it, get it over your head. By writing a manual encouraging people, I may never meet to engage both their supportive ancestors and the troubled dead. I've gone pretty far out on a limb. However, my experience tells me that anyone who is psychologically stable, has good intentions, and is willing to listen to their intuition can cultivate an empower, empowering relationship with their loving ancestors. By anyone, I really do mean anyone. 
You don't need to be a traditional shaman, a ghost whisperer, or a trained medium. You don't need to be descended from Cherokee healers, African chiefs, Taoists, masters, nor do you need to be a Christian, a Buddhist, pagan, or identify with any religious spiritual tradition. We all have love and support of ancestors that can draw upon these relationships for greater clarity about life purpose, increased health and vitality, and tangible support in daily life. Despite the challenges, you should know more fear the ancestors than you do the living. Each of us, no matter how troubled our recent family may be, descends from lineages that include loving, empowered human beings. These ancestors are no further from us than the blood and bones, and they are waiting to be welcomed into our lives to assist us in fulfilling our potential. I pray that this book will help you to draw the support of your people to express your soul's gift, your own happiness, and for well-being of your family, the earth, and generations to come. I also pray this book will lead to greater care and consideration in how we relate to the human dead and to help to reestablish the ancestors as one essential force and community in larger ecology, ecology of the sacred. Yeah, really good book. Uh, I recommend it. I highlighted some stuff in there in different parts of this. Yeah, this part right here was in this section. I think this is chapter one. Living and the dead can strongly affect one another. He says, and in my experience, the ancestors who are strong and bright in spirit are also the best guides and allies for the living family and members who seek to transform and end difficult integration burdens. Oh, that touched me right there. And then he goes on to what I thought was interesting too, because he has like an energy uh, a gauge where he he where he feels the ancestor ancestor who has the highest vibration but he does say just because they don't have the highest vibration doesn't mean that they're bad you know sometimes he, he choose ancestors that have an energy of, of six or more or seven or more he said he said but always feel the energy but it doesn't necessarily uh mean that they're bad it just means that they are not uh being elevated you know I thought that was interesting in this book, too. In brief, when we enjoy the active support of our loving ancestors, life tends to go more smoothly with higher levels of luck and ease and vitality. We also bring honor and joy to our ancestors when we heal inter intergenerational challenges, support healthy families, and live as good ethical people on earth. Like, I've said that. I've said that so many times. Will we assist the recently dead and those who are not yet well in spirit to complete their transition? We support the ancestors' health. Generally, any act of service that encourages healthy families, children, and a future for humans on earth also reverberate, reverberates in positive ways among the ancestors. Can you think of other ways in which you can benefit from ancestral support or bring honor and blessings to your people? You know, so it's uh, when the ancestors are not well in spirit, living elders may often feel physically and psychologically unwell. And so on down the generation, manifestations may include legacies of illness, addiction, physical and emotional abuse, isolation, poverty and early death. Uh, when we forget, and that's what's really going on with I'm talking like this because everything he named is going on in my family, like. This guy is so on target if you got trauma and that stuff going on in your family. Like, this is on target. This is, I'm telling you, all the things that I've been saying and talking about, he has it. When we forget our origins, we're more likely to enact and reinforce unhelpful intergenerational patterns, if only because no one has warned us about family burdens. Insofar as the ancestors look to us to heal the troubles passed down along the bloodlines. 
unwillingness to heal can keep them from fulfilling their role in the repair work. Uh, I just, I, I, that just touched me right there. Uh, what is this one? I think this is in part, I marked a whole bunch of stuff in part one. And really, I stopped marking it because I would have to highlight this whole book. That's just how much I love this book. Like, I will have to ha uh, highlight this whole book. <laughs> and I, that's when I just stopped. I was like, everything about this book I like, so I'm going to mess around and highlight this whole book if I'm not careful. So I just stopped highlighting because there's so much stuff in here that's just so useful. Okay, all the ancestors and the collective dead. Ideally, you will feel loved and supported by your older ancestors. However, assessing their support can call for healing and repair with living family and with recent ancestors. If you feel connection with older lineage ancestors whose names are now forgotten, how far back in time does this reach? And see, I and this this reminds me about me going to the mounds. I just been drawn to that area, to the Wheeler Beach area, and down there to the Toltec Mounds. And then when I ask for a confirmation, this woman comes giving me this Shama dagger. Like, hey, and the, and and these this has answered a lot of my questions. You know what I'm saying? Because I was adamant about that. I was adamant. I you know I really feel a connection to so many experiences I've had down there. So I really feel a connection with their pre-Columbian civilization. I do. I really do. Considering the following four categories as generalized starting point for distinguishing the ancestors whose names are forgotten. Ancient human ancestors 210,000 years ago. The first agriculturalist urban folk 10,000 to 2,000 years ago. Earlier ancestors known to history 2,000 to 500 years ago. Recent ancestors known to history 500 years ago. And he goes on deeper, naming the ancient human ancestors, you know, and the ancestors from a past 2,000 years. He's showing you how to work with each one. And what he also emphasized in the book is that the older the ancestor, the more elevated they're more likely to be. You know, the longer they've been dead, the more likely they have they are more they are elevated and that's he he kind of expressed that in the book the recent ones have a lot of elevation to do and they kind of we can help the process on our part by doing our rituals and honoring them doing rituals with our good ancestors for the most recent ones and it's not really us doing it we're just asking the older ancestors to help them elevate because we can't do it we can't really do that work we have to call on the older ancestors to do that work for us. Yeah. And that turned me out because in one of my meditations, uh, I talked about these older ancestors coming up to me, talking about the trauma in my family. Like, like that was a trip. Uh, okay, you guys, I'm, I'm going to stop. How do I know I'm not making this all up? Ah, I talk, we talked about that too because it does. He talks about meditation in there. And, you know, meditation is my, my, my famous thing because I do a lot of journeying. I do a lot of meditation. And if you guys have, have, have looked at my uh, book review on shamanism and psychology and consciousness, this is where it's all real, okay? This is an important question. Even those who talk to the dead people on a regular basis recognize that it's possible to make up things, to think you're in connection when you're not or just intuitively off the mark. One common concern centers about distinguishing imagination, fantasy, that driven from the spirit contact or refinement that I found com comes only with a balance of faith and healthy skepticism. With combined practice over time, remain patient as you gradually learn to trust your intuition with relating to unseen realms. You'll know, you'll know. It seemed like your imagination at first, even when it's real, but you test the spirit, you know what I'm saying? Test the spirit and ask for a sign. And if it's real, they'll give you a sign if it's real. I rarely see people de de destabilize merely by engaging in practices to honor and to get to know their loving ancestors. So that was in chapter one. I don't know if I, uh, I don't know if I marked anything in three. Yes, I did. I marked some in three. 
I'm not going to keep y'all long. I'm going to let you go. I mean, you know. But like I said, this is a really good book. This one um, section is called Communication Through Meditation and Trans and Direct Intuition. I like this because that is, I resonate with that. Uh, when I'm doing ancestor work, doing the meditation and trans, I resonate with that. And I go through a whole ritual. And some of the ritual that he was describing in here is exactly the thing I do when I'm, you know, uh, addressing the ancestors or even in my altar. I, it's, I just be like I be having church by myself up in here. It's a whole ritual process that I go through. But yeah, it, it was something. Uh, let me go on. One strategy includes quieting the mind and in order to trigger a shift in consciousness, which allows us to hear ancestral spirits more clearly. Practices can support this shift include meditation, contemplation, vision quests, fasting, retreats, and other removing external distractions. Sensory overload may achieve a similar purpose. Examples of practices on ecstatic and end of spectrum include sonic driving, drumming, rattling, intensive song and dance, psychological and physical ordeals, and intentional use of psycho substances. So, yeah, they tell, you know, that meditation, any type of trance, doing that type of work, you know, that's going to aid you in working with the ancestors. And see, I knew all this stuff. Okay. Oh, yeah, I thought this, too. Because it seemed like this, too. If you first start working with your ancestors, I think this chapter four. No, this chapter six. I'm skipping around. And then I'm going to close out. I don't want to keep you guys long, but I just want you to know that this is a very good book. Uh, it's valuable. I think 25 bu books... It is worth it's it is worth every penny. This book is worth every penny. Even if it was forty bucks, it would have been every worth every penny. It's priceless. It's something to keep keep with you. Okay. People occasionally have experienced that nothing happened during ritual. This is common. It can happen for many reasons, and it need not be a cause for discouragement. If you feel this happens. With the exercise that follows or with any rituals in this book, first go back to the exactly what exactly did happen. And see, you'll miss the sign. You know, everything is a sign. Like, first, it's, it's important for you to understand that everything around you is speaking to you as a reflection of you. The people that come in your life, it all of that, all of those are signs. So... You got to keep an open mind when you're getting a message from spirit because they speak in so many different ways. Often people report that nothing happened when, in fact, they received a great deal of information, especially for those new to spirit contact. The voice of inner knowing can begin as a whisper or still small voice that we gradually learn to trust more and more over time. Sometimes people discount direct spirit contact by overvaluing the visual auditory channels of perception because spirit speaks to you in different ways. You have to keep an open mind and then to know your thoughts, know your feelings. Uh, let me uh, let me go. Each of us has stronger, weaker pathways of intuition, and this can change over time, even from day day. To, uh, from one day to the next. For example, some people experience spirit contact through body sensations, dreams, or just a direct knowing. Be mindful of any pressure to have something specific happen. Relax and notice what you are experiencing during a ritual. Other times, it's actually true that nothing in particular happens. This can occur for a multitude of reasons. You may simply be distracted or sleep, sleepy, having a rough day, or otherwise not in your most intuitive state. Be kind with yourself. Don't make up a big story about it all. And try again on a different day. Also, the ancestors may take a moment to respond to your request for direct contact. 
Remember, centuries may have passed since a living relative have sought ancestral connection. So it's sensible to allow your people some time to reply. When they do reply, the contact may come during the waking's ritual or through a dream visit, waking synchronicity, or some other kind of spontaneous contact. If staying receptive and tenacious doesn't yield results, results over time. Reconfirm that you're where you need to be with your lineage of focus and that you're fully on board personally with the work. If needed, reaching out for the support, but stay hopeful as we all have loving ancestors, even if they're far back along the lineage. The exercise that follow presents a ritual progression for connecting with ancestral guide. In addition to the more general guidelines given above, keep the following consideration in mind. You know, and then he goes in here and give you rituals and meditations for going in, connecting with your ancestors. Like this is a really good book. But like I said, the only thing I disagree with because he was saying too, which made no sense to me. He was talking about people doing journey work and going outside of our consciousness and doing this journey work and, and people being labeled as a witch, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And that seemed, to me, when he started talking like that, that was like a, from a religious point of view. Out of, out of that, that, that part, maybe that wasn't his view. Maybe there was another view of someone else that he was speaking on. But I didn't like that because uh, what do you call meditation? When you're having this experience, when you're meeting the ancestors, you are shifting your consciousness outside of your body. You are, you know, because you're dealing with your astral body. You're meeting your ancestors with your astral eyes, so to speak, your astral body. So you are shifting your consciousness outside of your body. You're using this eye instead of these eyes because you're going within looking because it's a brand new world inside of us. The astral world is a part of us. Everything is connected. You know, it's so hard to explain that. I don't want to get into that. But uh, that's the only thing I disagree with. Uh, and then the other part is, you know, when I, like I said, when I got to chapter 11, part of that, like, was not that I didn't disagree with it, but I just didn't, I never heard of that. So I just don't know what to make of it. So, uh, but like I said, this is a really good book. I do recommend it, Ancestral Medicine. I got it at um, Amazon, 200 and the almost 300 pages because it's like 290 some pages 12 chapters great book i recommend it but i thank you so much for being here with me today light and love 